All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. Welcome to episode 305 of the KISS FAQ Podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill. Our panel today is comprised of the voice of reason, 69th Blizzard, Ken. Hey. hey and Marcus Almighty, Mark. Greetings. And St. Louis KISS, Lonnie. What's up? So, Ken, you've obviously bought some new KISS shit because I got it in the post as well. Yeah, I got the uh, stay-at-home tour for KISS shirt. Uh, <laughs> it's cool. That- that goes to the you know the proceedings uh, of the uh, I guess the road crews and so on uh, that work uh, you know all obviously all the concerts are canceled or postponed at this time it's just not not kids only I think it's, it's everything it represents everybody yeah. life uh, out life there is on hold it contributes to them and you know I wanted to do it because you know it's a, a, a good cause you know to help them out. Since yeah. you know they need need income, a lot of people get inf- got affected by that. Even here in Toronto, there's a guy that does a sound for a lot of the bands that come through the clubs here, and he started a GoFundMe for all the fellow sound men and the tech guys and stuff like that. And it was a good idea. He 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 started raising quite a bit. Like I think it's over ten thousand bucks now. So that's pretty good considering. Yeah, a lot of a lot of bands are doing that sort of thing. Metallica's doing its fundraiser every Monday when it does its uh, videos. Mm-hmm. Since I've watched every single one, I g- finally gave them some money this oh, week. Oh yeah, so, you know, it, <laughs> Monday's it, it, was good. Yeah, well, the I was eight, eighty-three. The, yeah. the club gig, really. Um, so you know, it's it's all very cool. So um, it's the fortieth anniversary of Unmass. We've done an episode on Unmass previously, um, so. Th- Check out episode 248. I think I've posted it all over the place because I thought that was actually a pretty good episode. Andy Moyen, of course, texted me today and said, got to mention how they should never put I Still Say They Stink on the front cover of a Kiss album. And yeah, I agree. Uh, so some quick thoughts on the an- the 40th anniversary of Unmasked, Lonnie. Um, it's for, you know, it's it's. Ex- it's exciting, I guess. It's the 40th anniversary of Unmasked. It was cool they came out with their that the band had like their little bundle gear yesterday on the website, minus the colored vinyl though, no colored vinyl, which, oh. like, which was took me by surprise for sure. I was hoping to hoping to snag it, so I was a little taken back by that. But I guess maybe state of the world, they just weren't able to uh, to put it together the last you know couple couple months. So, but. I didn't, it's one of the albums I didn't get till till later on, and again, be, probably because of the the cover is one of the albums. It's not one of the albums I picked up right away. I didn't know a lot of songs on it. The album looked goofy, and it said they stink on it, so I didn't buy it right away. It was one of the last ones I I picked up to to complete my Kiss collection. But but it's a fun album, so I, I'm excited to talk to talk about it with you guys. Yeah. So uh, you know, as as far as me, I love that merchandise. The uh, unmasked T-shirt with those vivid mm-hmm. colors looks really good. The one uh, that's more of the album cover looks really cool. I'm very tempted, mm-hmm. so I may do that. And you know, as for vinyl, I still think they should be reproducing kind of the Mexican multi swirl um, for yeah. for that one, or in a multicolored <laughs> splatter like that. So who knows? Yeah. Well, to come down the road, I don't think these guys are done by any means. As for the album, obviously it grew on me because I bought it on cassette and could barely read where it said I still say, say they stink. So you know, back in those days, it was hardly noticeable. But in terms of an album, it never sat well with me. It was a little bit, come on, I'd rather listen to Rock and Roll Over than Unmasked. Still the case. But it's grown on me over the years. And just like the Peter Chris solo album, there are times that I'm in the mood for that sort of music. So I'll spin it. Mark, what about you? Yeah, ironically, it's the same thing for me. I got that album last. I actually got it on cassette as well, uh, last. And, uh, The funny thing with that is that when I first listened to it as well, I found that it didn't really resonate with me at all when I first got it. You know, back then when I was getting those cassettes and stuff like that, I was, you know, listening to Metallica and stuff like that. So it was kind of like very soft compared to what I was listening to at that time. But that album has really grown on me. I mean, it's one of the records that I actually started collecting a lot of vinyl variations of for some reason. And I just enjoy listening to it now. I can kind of appreciate it 
more for what it was meant to be than I could when it first came out. So yeah, it's it's not a bad record. Yeah, there you go. There we go. That is a thing of beauty. Well, Ken, it's your turn to talk about it too. <laughs> Let's see if you could talk while putting that back in its. Well, I like it enough, I guess, to collect it, um, collect the vinyl or multiple copies of it. Um, yeah, uh, again, that that was a it was a good surprise because I wasn't expecting it. I didn't see any advertising for it. I just saw it in this when I was walking in the record store. Usually, my at least once a week uh, <laughs> travel to the record store, and so yeah, I took it home and I thought, oh. Okay, well, it's, it was kind of more on the dynasty, that trend of uh, going more pop, right? Um, but it's, and there's a lot of standout songs on it that I enjoyed. Um, it was it was very much a summer, a summer album for me that summer. I played a heck of a lot during that summer of 80. It's a good album. Yeah, so because we've done an episode about it before, you know, there's no point repeating it or treading over that ground. Maybe in five years we'll re revisit that um, if anyone's still doing podcasts then. So what I thought would be a good topic to come out of that is to do a ranking of our top 10 Kiss-tastic pop songs. Because obviously Kiss has done, run the gamut in terms of genres that they've gone. They've gone from Alice in Chains all the way to kind of McCartney, Lennon, you know, ballads and, you know, singer, songwriter type crap. So in terms of pop, um, what were the songs that this panel would select? And obviously we do our magic formula to come up with our top 10. Between the four of us, we came up with 25 songs that we thought represented the best of Kiss's pop. And to narrow it down, we're only going to talk about the top 10 and then everyone can bitch about how their song did not make the list because I did weird math to make sure that their song didn't make the list. But how did you approach this question? Because I, I said, you know, how do you approach pop? Because everyone kind of interprets it slightly differently. I think of Kiss and Pop and it immediately gives me an image in my head of Paul Stanley recounting the time that he played a song for Gene the very first time. He's kind of bopping his head and kind of happy music. <laughs> and that's what pop for me kind of does. It's got a happy beat. It's got light, um, to a certain extent, light music. And it's positive, makes you smile, and is not necessarily, you know, raise your fist and yell type of music. Mark, yeah. what is pop to you? Well, pop, I kind of took it kind of a, in the literal sense, which is pop is a short form of popular music. Um, and really, pop has been attached to so many different kinds of music, you know, pop rock, you know, alt pop. There's like, you know, pop metal even I've heard before. Um, but, the, but the thing is, it's, you know, it's all about the feel. It's all about the sort of chorus in it. You know, a pop song is mainly about the chorus. If it has a big chorus, you know, that's usually tied to a to a pop song. I mean, one of the greatest things I ever heard about uh, how important a pop song is is this producer guy I used to know when I was much younger. He was talking about You Give Love a Bad Name. He goes, if you think about it, you know, shot through the heart. It's like like a two and four kind of beat. But he said, if you go ahead there and put like a really big blast beat over like da -da -da -da, you can still sing the same thing over top of it, but it would never have that same pop feel to it right it's all about that kind of feel and the kind of pocket that they play and that it's that kind of thing that gives it that sort of feel in the end a lot of the things that julian mentioned too are critical to it as well positive vibe that sort of lyrical context you know if you write about you know more uplifting methods or uh, up, up, upbeat kind of lyrics then of course it'll be more in that style right i mean if you write a, like a really depressive typo negative type of lyric that wouldn't be in the pop vein. So uh, to me, it's sort of that end of it where it's, you know, geared toward radio. It's geared toward, you know, the popular uh, fan base where they want the more simpler kind of easy structured song too. I think that's also critical too. You don't want a eight minute song with seven different parts into it. That doesn't really fall into a pop sort of format. Nice. Lonnie, what about you? You know, when I, 
approach doing this list, you know, that was that was the first thing that came to my mind is well, ten Kiss pop songs. Well, what what is pop? You know, what do I consider a Kiss pop song? You know, what is pop music to me? You know, and and I think we're all going to have very similar answers that it's it's happy music and songs that are catchy. To me, that's what stood out to me more than anything is songs songs that are, are happy and catchy are you know that that aren't written in a minor key you know you know like yeah. that you know thing things that are are upbeat and lifting up uplifting so that's that's how i that's how i took it is 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 just catchy and happy and and things like that and 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 aren't and aren't too heavy you know because i think i think there, there's a fine line that that we had to say, well, no, that song's too heavy for me to consider pop. And, it, and it's all going to be, you know, about what our personal opinion is of what, what separates rock from pop. So it'll be interesting to, uh, well, you know, to see how it shakes out. Yeah, see see what the critic feedback is on our pop selections. Mm -hmm. Ken, how about you? How What do you judge to be pop? Yeah, it's all subjective. I, I think, you know, Mark said it very well, um, explaining, you know, popular music and, and so on. Um, yeah, there's power pop, pop, you know, pop rock. It goes on and on, <laughs> all the different kinds of pop. <laughs> but, you know, I started listening. I was listening to AM, AM type radio. Back then it was basically pop music, and FM was usually uh, for uh, album cuts and that side yeah. of thing. It played some of the regular stuff by album cuts. So it's AM radio, and it's always going to be stuff that, that is very catchy, Stuff that's memorable you, that you can sing along to um, doesn't always necessarily have to be happy. Um, there's a lot of so songs out there, you know, like just for instance, "Breaking Up" is hard to do. That's not a happy song, really, necessarily, but it's a good pop song. So things like that. Even you know, a lot of the Carpenter songs were sad songs, but they were fantastic pop songs. Great melodies, great singing. Um, and always there's usually the guitars are if there's guitars there's you know they're they're back they're they're lower in the in the mix so that's that's what I think pop is yep all right well let's get straight into this ranking as I mentioned the four of us came up with a list of 25 songs each of us picking our 10 favorites so some of them did not make the cut so let's start in 10th place on six points let me know and I'm the only one who voted for this song, and it's just because when we're this far down the list, it really did get into one person could skew the whole list. And I, I kind of alluded to it when I was telling you about my definition of pop, of imagining Paul Stanley kind of bopping and happily singing mm -hmm. Sunday Driver to Gene the first time those two met. And it's total pop. You know, straight from the first album, it was one of the songs on that album that showed the elements of that sort of music. So to this day, it's one that I enjoy. It's just a really happy song for a guy who doesn't usually like happy songs. What are your thoughts on Let Me Know, Lonnie? You know, I wish I would have put it on my list that after the way you described it, because I really like Let Me Know. It's one of my, it's one of my, you know, more favorite Kiss songs. And, and you're right, it does have a very pop type feel to it and i you know i love you know obviously i love that gene and paul trade vocals on it um i i think it, it's it's a great song I, I i wish i could go back and redo my list already because i i, I think it definitely belongs on there it's, it's great it's fantastic yeah, we'll probably hear that sort of comment, you know, several more times when we talk about some of these other songs that maybe individually we didn't pick that others did. Mark, what are your thoughts? And let me know. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great pick. I mean, right away that whole top of it, you can already kind of hear that, like the, you know, like a tambourine or something in there. Let me be your Sunday drive. Like it's it's totally pop that whole top of the song there. And again. For Gene Simmons, you know, too, that's that's a pretty happy sounding melody for him to be singing in there. So, I mean, it pop pop music was not foreign to Gene by any stretch of the imagination, obviously. Yep, Ken. Well, yeah, it's it's I was almost on my list. <laughs> it almost made my list. I wish you let me know that it was on your list, actually, at a time. <laughs> but uh Sorry for that. Uh, but, but yeah, I agree. It's a very popular song. It's the most, on that album, it's, it's, it's the most Beatles-like song, I would say. It's the, if they're influenced by anything, that's 
that's the closest. And uh, and they, I like the way they would do that one. They had done that in concert way back, I guess, a few times, where they extend the "Let Me Know" part uh, out, and mm-hmm. it, which is mm-hmm. I wish they would have done on the album, actually. So good, it's a good song. Well, moving into ninth place on seven points, it was, there was actually a tie, but I did a little tiebreaker. Um, it was a song that only you picked, Ken. Christine, oh, really? 16, and uh, tell us why. <laughs> it made the list. Uh, well, it is a poppy song. I mean, you got the, the piano going. Um, the guitars are in there, but, you know, they're not so up front. And, it's, again, it's a, it's a catchy chorus. Uh, you know, the verses are nice, um, and Gene does a good job on it. Um, of course, nowadays it seems more creepy. Uh, back when I was, a, you know, young, it, did, it didn't seem creepy. I didn't think about it. You know, I was like, oh yeah, what am I? I was like 17 probably when I first heard that or whatever. And I thought, oh yeah, you're, you know, 16. You're like, well, oh, that's all cool, you know. But now, <laughs> if you just look at it, it's like, well, okay, maybe that's not right. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's a good. It's it's a good song. Um, <laughs> the other thing about it is uh, it was like that my second one of my you know early favorite songs of, of Gene Simmons after Doctor Love. Doctor Love was really the first one. And then I heard Christina Sixteen. Oh, she this is another great one. You know, um, so yeah, I like the catchy stuff, especially the back then. Yep, Mark. What about Christine Sixteen for you? Yeah, it it's definitely has all those elements that we were talking about before. Like you have the, uh, you know, the piano, you know, part on top there. Dun, 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 dun. That's like a total pop music kind of thing where you're putting it over and like I can said, the guitar of the whole song. So, uh, yeah, I, I definitely think that it's uh, it has all the elements of making a popular song. Uh, and the backing vocals are fantastic. So that's mm-hmm. one of the other strong parts yeah. of it. Yeah, and I, I was snapping my fingers when you froze there for a moment, in case you're wondering, or maybe you oh, noticed. Yeah. Lonnie, Christine, 16. Um, you know, I, I think it's very poppy. It's very catchy, you know. Um, the type of song that has you singing along with it, you know, by the time this the, sec- the chorus hits the second time, the first time you hear it, you know. And that's a lot of the time, that's a, a great definition of a pop song is, you're able to sing along with it before the song's over the first time you're listening to it. And, you know, I, when I was in high school, one of my best friends, Matt Aubuchon, he was, we were seniors and he was dating a girl named Christine. And I asked Christine, how old are you? And she said, I'm 16. And I go that, and I go, that is so freaking cool. And they looked at me and they go, why? (laughs) You guys don't even know. (laughs) Oh my god! Yeah, exactly. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Okay, <laughs> Christine, sixteen. Yeah, I didn't even think of that one, and uh, I, I mentioned it as we were talking about the show before we did the show. Was uh, it? It's not often that Gene did something really poppy like that that actually made a Kiss album. Obviously, there's a little bit more on you know some of his uh, solo releases, you know, but very good pick again and one that i almost regret not including on my own all right moving on into eighth place on eighth points anything for my baby so let's see who had that oh i had that and lonnie did lonnie let's start with you on that anything for my baby i think i think you know there's there's a i picked a number of songs off dress to kill because i consider dress to kill to be very even though it's guitar driven, I still consider Dress to Kill a lot of the songs on there to be very poppy, um, v- very catchy type songs. And, we, and we've talked about that when we talked about Dress to Kill, um, about how Neil Bogart was really looking for, you know, the, it was Neil, obviously it was produced by Neil. It was, you know, it's Neil's type of music, you know, these, these single type, catchy type songs. And anything for my baby is, is like definition of a, of, of a catchy type of Kiss song. Um, you know, just, the with um you know the way the chorus starts off even I mean, it's the way the chorus is the first thing you hear as opposed to a verse that like they just put that implant that that chorus in your head right away and then repeat it several times you know as the song goes on 
you know, and, and, and there are, they're very happy and catchy type verses and, and lyrics. So I, I, I really enjoy that. I, I really enjoy Dress to Kill. So um, I, I had to put this one on my list. Yeah, so it made the very bottom of my list, 10th place, and uh, pure bubblegum. And mm-hmm. exactly what Neil Bogart was trying to do for them at the time. So there's a, quite a bit on that album we've talked about before. But it's so, you can't stop bopping your head, at least I can't, lose all control. So, uh, Ken, your thoughts on anything from a baby? Yeah, it's. I, I like. It. I mean, it's. Uh, it, I probably considered it from my list as at least like maybe a top twenty. I would guess in mine. Um, I know it crossed my mind. Um, I guess the only thing that drew uh, drew back that pick for me was uh, I, I just never liked the to anything for my babies or whatever that they did at the very beginning of the song just to start it off i would have had to cut that off and just had the guitar start part when the guitars kick in and go from there but uh other i mean that's just a nit, nitpicky thing but it's a really good you know well-written pop song and paul does a great job on it mark yeah it's it's interesting that you mentioned that you would have cut that part out because that's actually one of the known writing devices of a pop song to introduce the chorus first to kind of Mm -hmm. lodge it into your brain right but i mean i hey it's it's you know it's all personal taste like we said before right so but uh yeah it's it's definitely catchy Um, i mean i remember the first time i heard it it was instantly stuck into my head right away when i when i heard it so it it's definitely doing its job in that sense and uh you know it's uh very uplifting it's all positive about how you know he's into this girl and stuff like that so you know it's it has all the markings of a strong pop song and lonnie brought up a good point too being that you know bogart was overseeing the record i mean he made his living writing these kinds of songs he was a bubblegum bubblegum king from before right Mm -hmm. when he was with uh buddha records right so uh I, i definitely think that he doesn't get enough credit, I think, for maybe the influence he had on that record. Yep, exactly. Yeah. All right, moving on into seventh place, and we're still in the zone where a single person can skew our ranking, <laughs> Ken. That's what I do. On nine points, hard luck woman. So tell us about that uh, in your pick. Yeah, well, First of all, I saw some of these lists ahead of time before this episode. And I know there seems there's a lot of Gene Simmons and Peter Chris haters there on the other panelists here. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> you'll see in their picks. But, uh, yeah, Hard Luck Woman, I mean, how can you go wrong with that? That was going to be like Paul was writing for Rod Stewart, writing that song for Rod Stewart to sing. Of course, Rod Stewart can already write music himself, so he didn't need this song. <laughs> um, and he already wrote one, written one that, you know, Maggie May, that was pretty darn close to it in style. So, um, yeah, but Hard Luck Woman is a great song. It's Peter, still, you know, uh, sung well by Peter Chris, um, And it's, again, another catchy, poppy, nice poppy acoustic type pop song um and i've always always loved it since i first heard it it's always been a favorite you know of mine well all right ken um not ken mark yeah again okay no (laughs) (laughs) one more time yeah um yeah so it it's definitely falls into the bracket of pop music obviously uh like ken said it was written in mind of giving it to you know Rod Stewart, and obviously he writes that sort of pop music because he wants to get on the radio, and he was, you know, covering radio a lot at that time. And I mean, another great piece of evidence to show how strong a pop song it is is that you have people like, you know, Garth Brooks, who did a cover of it, didn't change really necessarily anything of it. He just sang it, you know, in his own voice, and you know, it was just as strong a song then as it was when it first came out, you know, so it worked as a pop song, you know, several years after the fact as well. Yep. Lonnie. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good song. I didn't, I didn't really consider it for my list. I mean, although, although it is a, it's a great song and a good pop song, I guess I didn't, I guess I consider, I don't know, more of a ballad than a pop song, but I guess, you know, it's one and the same and it's whatever you're, 
you know, again, what you consider to be pop music, but I could call myself a hypocrite because I put a ballad in there in my list at the same time. So, um, I don't know. It's a great or, song. Or you could call yourself a Peter hater. I am not a Peter hater. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> wow. I, I, I think any, words any, in my mouth. <laughs> yeah, I think anyone's definitions are very, the goalposts can move substantially yeah. when doing these and, things. And it, yeah. And, I, I click, yeah. I, I almost feel guilty for having not selected it because, uh, again, I, I don't really feel it to be, for my taste or my definition, I don't really feel it to be pop um, because of the acoustic guitar. You know, so it's kind of like the MTV plug, uh, unplugged version <laughs> is so plugged into my head that I feel it's more of an acoustic thing. But I think the point that's been made about Garth Brooks taking it and kind of giving it a country, you know, uh, um, kind spin. of horror. yes, a slight spin, you know, mm -hmm. certainly makes the point very, very clear about it. All right, let's move on. Um, mm -hmm. In sixth place on 12 points, sure know something. Mm -hmm. And there are two of us who had that pick, uh, me. And mm -hmm. I, I don't really know why. It just feels very poppy with his image and the video and, and all that. And again, probably because a little bit of, you know, it, it was kind of one of the first songs that they did in the catalog that started to take them in that direction. Um, more radio friendly, more accessible than the heavy thunder demon rock. Mark, you also had a, a exact same ranking as me. Yeah, I, I definitely think it falls into that whole category. I mean, you know, the introduction is very, uh, you know, interesting it catches your attention right away that whole bass and drum bit at the beginning but even like the verse you know it's very upbeat and very snappy finger snappy when you listen to him singing that it's very uh very much a song that goes to that whole structure of songwriting and heavy on the two and the four beat all the time when he when he does the singing and you know lots of harmonized singing in there which does it as well and because it's so upbeat I mean, you just can't help but find your foot going to it, you know, and it's obviously written in a, in a way that they were hoping that it would make some impact on radio somehow, because just like they kind of approached that with, you know, I was made for loving you, that they, I think they wanted to follow down that path when maybe doing other material in that sort of thinking. Yep. Lonnie. You know, I, I, I didn't have it on my list, obviously, but... <laughs> Again, I, I feel kind of guilty for not having it on my list because I really I really like sure know something. And I guess I guess I guess I just wasn't considering it to be poppy, but it is very poppy, you know. So shame on me for not having it on my list. I probably should have had it on there as opposed to something else I did because I really enjoy sure know something. Um and you know like like in, in ninety five just when they did Unplugged, had an even greater appreciation for sure mm -hmm. of something because I thought they did such a great job on MTV Unplugged. But um, but it is it is very catchy, very poppy. And, you know, it's a song you can catch yourself singing later after you listen to it earlier in the day. So it, it definitely falls in the category. Yeah, but you only had 10 picks, so you had to go... That's true. You had to go with your gut. So, Ken, sure knows something. It sure something. It was on my list, actually. Um, I had... I was take, putting songs on and then taking them off, putting them back on and switching them around, and uh, it was really close to making the list for me. Um, it's a you know, great song, um, a great I like the the verses and the way it builds to that you know kind of a, a rocking chorus. But you know even though it's it's the chorus is more when I think of the the riff and the chorus, I think of sometimes I think of it has that similar riff as tonight you belong to me has in it uh if if you've ever noticed that um i don't know but uh it's it's a good song i mean it, again like lonnie said the uh, unplugged version kind of like reminded me how good that song really was after so, however so many years you know uh that album was out prior to it so uh, yeah great song it almost made my list almost made it yeah Ditto with me on on mass, but we've said it before. We'll say it many times again in the future. The impact that album had on making you really appreciate some of the songwriting and uh, songs that Kiss have written, 
Um, so that had 12 points. And in fifth place on 13 points, again, Mark and I combined to bring Magic Touch to the list. So, Mark. Yeah, well, I mean, Magic Touch is obviously uh, one of these songs that was constructed to be, you know, a sort of pop radio kind of song. Like, even though the guitars are kind of more dominant in this song, it's it's very much, though, a sort of catchy, you know, easy to remember riff. That dun, 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 dun. It's so memorable, that whole part. And right away, they jump in with the most catchy part of the song. She's got the magic, that whole chorus mm-hmm. part with the magic touches. Right away, as soon as they jump in with that, it, they got you hook, line, and sinker there, right? So, I, again, older, strong songs, I noticed that they kind of introduce parts of the chorus and sometimes even the whole chorus near the very top of the song. It's a very pop thing to do in a song. I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, only pop songs that do that, but, you know, it is a very strong device of the pop writing structure. So uh, I I think it's very good. I think that uh, Paul really uh, hit the ball out of the park on that song. I was always surprised they never played it live, but it's good that he played on his solo tour. Yeah, absolutely. Ken, magic touch. Yeah, another song that was on my list. <laughs> I took it off because <laughs> right, I decided to replace it with something else because I was going through it. I was like, well, you know what? This other one should be on. But uh, yeah, like Mark said, it's a, a great pop song and a great chorus, a memorable, memorable chorus. I always liked it from the first time I listened to the album. It was the what second song on the album for me <laughs> when I played <laughs> That's that. That's right. When I played that album, so uh, it was always stood out to me as a as a song that probably should have been released as a single, really, in my opinion. Yep, Lonnie. Yeah, I agree. It should have been released as a single. I I really enjoy Magic Touch, and like Ken, I I had it on, I took it off too. Um, I, <laughs> I I I really like that. I really like that song, um, and was really was really happy when Paul did it in, on a solo tour in '06, and we got you know and you know somewhat of an official live version of it just mm-hmm. to hear just to hear that song how it would work you know played by a live band with paul stanley singing it still you know so it is a great song it's very poppy very catchy like mark said again like anything for my baby starts off with with that chorus hits you with that chorus right away so it kind of sticks in your brain so great song can't argue with it being on the list yeah and you brought up an interesting point which is what made it actually hit my list was back when I first heard Dynasty it was kind of middling for me um, you know I, I was more I preferred X-ray eyes and charisma and sure know something more than magic touch but it was during the 2006 tour when you finally got to hear it live that it really became you know a great song that I kind of revisited and you know that's why it made it onto my list in in the end all right moving on into fourth place and now you know these top four really uh, are separated from everything else below it because there's much more consensus on this I'm surprised this actually is as low and I'm actually very hurt by you guys Um, (laughs) so fourth place 18 points turn on the night which was Mm. my number one pick and I adore that song. I always will. It is just my go to a happy place song, it being probably one of the happiest moments on the Crazy Nights album, which I've you know often told the story of how it nearly made me not a Kiss fan. Uh, but Turn on the Night was a missed hit, as far as I'm concerned. It was great late '80s pop, uh, very well crafted, very well executed. Um, Mark, let's go with you next because you also ranked it highly. Yeah, I mean, this is the song I remember. I've said it many times on other episodes where this was one of the songs that are embedded deep in my head because when I went to California the first time and I rented a convertible car, this came on the radio on the sort of XM system that they had at the time there. And uh, it, it just really set the whole tone for my trip to California, that song. It's so uppity and everything that i think about when i think of california is that kind of uh pop song and uh you, you know the the big thing about 
of this era of Kiss and this sort of pop music is it was all about the big synth pads back then. All those underlying yeah. synth sounds on there, that's what really brought it to that uh, pop element. Every band and their brother was hiring keyboard players and during this time. And it's funny because as quickly as all these keyboard players came in, right around the 89, 90, when it started to become you know, cooler to like stuff like Guns N' Roses and stuff like that. Everybody fired their keyboard players. They didn't want that sound anymore. They wanted to be back to more Les Pauls and Marshalls, right? But back then, and between the time of, let's say, 85 to like 87, everybody had a keyboard player with a DX7 keyboard, and you were getting these big synthy pads that were underneath stuff. I mean, even Ozzy Osbourne for Ultimate Sin had mm. keypads and synths and stuff like that under there too. You never would have thought that. But, you know, it was part of producers' uh, sort of tricks that they had for their production. Ron, Ron Nevison, who did those two records, The Crazy Nights and Ultimate Sin, you know, he was, he was known for using those kind of keyboard pads to bulk up the choruses and stuff like that. And, you know, it's a, a great song. I Vocally, I think it's one of Paul Stanley's strongest vocal performances, and it's totally geared for radio, that it didn't make a bigger impact as a complete crime. Yeah, Lonnie, you also had this on your list. Yeah, I did. I really enjoy Turn On the Night. I, I when, you, when you think of Kiss Pop, I, 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 it was one of the first songs that came to mind to me. Um, like you guys, I agree, it should have been a bigger hit for him. I, I, I don't understand why it wasn't, because it is very poppy. It is very catchy. It's very much in tune with what was popular in 1987 when Crazy Nights came out. Um and, and it's very Kiss sounding at the same time. It's very poppy, but it's also very Kiss sounding, um, where it doesn't seem like out of, like it, like they're reaching for something, because it's it's very you know it's a you know, turn on the night just sound just just the song title by itself turn on the night sounds like a Kiss song, hmm. you know a pop you know a, again a positive uplifting type song just sounds in tune with, with Kiss. So I enjoyed the song. It you know it's first time I heard Crazy Nights. It was. A standout to me, and I didn't even know that they had released it as a single. You know, when I when I first bought Crazy Nights, you know. So I mean, sometimes you just know a good song when you hear it. So and that and that's one of them. So Ken, tell us how this was on your list but got bumped off. <laughs> it was, you know, it it wasn't on my list, but it was. I considered it. I did consider it, but it didn't. <laughs> I was like, oh, should I pick that? I said, that's a really good song. Um, but I picked something else from that album, in in its place uh, that I thought. You know, should have been huge, but uh, yeah, Turn of the Night to me uh, probably should have been released as the lead single over Crazy Nights. You know, just an opinion, even though Crazy Nights is a pretty darn good another song that's well written too. But I just think Turn of the Night should have been released earlier. It should have been earlier, probably placed earlier, much earlier in the album too, not stuck on it as a footnote on the end of the album. Um, but Having said that, I mean, it almost made my list a great, just a great song. Uh, I, I would never skip that one if I if that came on my you know player or whatever. Um, so it's a good pick. All right, so moving into third place on twenty three points again, a song that three of us picked. Uh, Ken, you didn't pick "Lover All I Can." <laughs> Well, you know, it, it, again, it's it's a real good song. Uh, you know, it just didn't make my list. Uh, what can I say? I, Love Rock, I, I can see why you guys picked it, uh, but I was just trying to, uh, from my standpoint, I was trying to spread it out more, um, at least spread out the, uh, the number of albums, uh, trying to include more stuff. So, um, but... You know, having said that, it's it's just a really good song, good catchy song. I can't say you know anything bad about it because it, hey, I love the song. It just didn't make my list. Yeah, because of course it was done by Wicked Lester first. It wasn't really a Kiss song. Okay. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> there, you, there you go. Um, I I voted the lowest of the three of us who did pick it. So, uh, you know, I, I love the song. It's one of the few Kiss songs that I could get up on stage with the guitar, sing and play right now. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and I, I hope before it's all said and done that I get the opportunity to do so. I, it's one of my favorite songs. And again, it's uh, kind of entertaining that it's another one from Dress to Kill, which is not one of my favorite Kiss albums, but it's a really, really good song. It's fun to sing and play. It's fun to sing along to or screech along to. Um, and and it's just a, a timeless song that I'll never not smile when I hear. Uh, Mark, you and Lonnie both scored it the same, so why don't you go first? Okay. Um, so, yeah, Love Her All I Can. Uh, from the record that we were discussing, you know, Dress to Kill, the pop influence from Bogart is evident again in this. Uh, Three-part harmonies right at the very top of the song, right in the verse. You know, I mean, there you go. I mean, how much more pop do you get than that? You know, and I mean, the, the introduction of the song, uh, those little chords that dan -dan -dan -dan, and that's already already like has that really uppity kind of vibe to it or, where you're like, oh, boy, you know, th this is going to be something, again, that's very catchy and poppy. And again, another element that I'm sure Bogart stepped in and told them is that, OK, guys, let's try to keep these songs under three minutes in and out. That's like I remember producers to always say that. Come on, guys, in and out, you know, get to the chorus and then get the hell out of there, you know, so. I think that, that that's one of those things that uh, he tried to put in to, to give it that sort of chance also for radio, because, you know, like Ken was saying, AM radio was king back in the day. And AM radio was never known for playing four minute songs, even let alone like five minute songs. So, you know, if you had a two minute, 45 second song, you're, you know, in contention to be being played. So it has all the elements of a great pop song, great vocals catchy choruses, catchy verse, which gives it even more strength to it that not only does the chorus strong, but the verse is strong, right? I mean, the verse is usually a setup to the chorus, but because they're both strong, it makes it that much stronger. So great song. And Lonnie. I love Love Her All I Can. It's a great song. Again, it's going to echo a lot of the stuff that I had said about anything for my baby that, you know, and what Mark just said too, with, with Bogart, you know, structuring these, these poppy type songs. Um, you know, they, they were running low on material probably when they went in to do Dress to Kill. We had Lover All I Can from from the Wicked Lester days. Bogart probably looked at that and says, hey, we can we can make this, you know, my type of song and kind of kind of mold it the way I want these songs to sound on Dress to Kill. And, and, and that's probably how it turned out and what happened. And I think it's a great song. I, I love the guitar at the beginning. I love, you know, the harmony and the chorus. It's it, it's one of my favorite Kiss songs. It's fantastic. Right, so off the same album, again, the uh, the third song off Dress to Kill, in second place on 28 points, Come On and Love Me. Um, Ken. Yeah, well, that one was my number one pick. Um, might have been the only pick I picked off of, you know, apart from you guys, it's my only pick from Dress to Kill, even though there is a lot on Dress to Kill that could have been on there and that were close to being on my list. But Come On and Love Me is just a great song, uh, catchy chorus, uh, great, great verses. Um, I mean, right from the time you, you hear it kick in, it's it's already going to catch you. You know, it's you're going to start almost humming <laughs> to this song it's it's that it's that good of a song and uh that one that should have been was it a single i don't know i can't remember now um but if it, if it, yes, it was yes. okay okay well, well rightly so it should have been a single uh probably i guess second to what rock and roll All night obviously um but which is another great song but it's rock and roll, right? Um, but th this one maybe could have been the first single, and it, maybe they would have gotten a hit out of it somehow. Yeah, it Being was the, first. It, it was the first single. Oh, it was the first. I, single. I believe okay. NB eight four one, and then okay. well, rock and roll night was NB eight five zero. Well, thank you for that, but I cannot remember that, those numbers. That puts uh, it the rest. Singles. Uh, I haven't studied lately. That. But uh, yeah. Anyway, it, whether it is, I mean, it, it's just a great nerds, song. First nerds, or second nerds, singer, nerds, 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 yeah, nerds, nerds, nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them had getaway on the B side. So uh, yeah, well, Lonnie, you also ranked this highly. I think I also had it number one. It's you know maybe maybe my favorite Kiss song. Um, even though it doesn't come off Revenge, like you guys always like to give me shit about. It, but it's probably but it is probably my favorite. 
favorite Kiss song. I, I love Come On and Love Me. And I, I couldn't, and it, and it is poppy, but it is guitar driven. I love, you know, the guitars at the beginning of the song that, you know, it, it is both. It's, it's, it's pop and rock. And again, up to interpretation of anybody what's what, but um, I love the song. It's, it's catchy. It's, it's heavy at the same time. And it's, it's just very Kiss. The song, the song is very, if you want to describe Kiss, I mean, that song is, is very what Kiss is all about. But that it, it's guitar driven, but it's it's poppy at the same time, and it's catchy, and it just has fun verses too. I mean, it's 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 almost the perfect Kiss song. All right, Mark. Yeah, ironically, I didn't have this on my list at all, um, and that's probably because of the fact that while I I did have it in my master list, I think I mainly uh-huh. didn't I didn't put it on because I think that. I was convinced that everybody else would have it on here, so I didn't think that it wouldn't make the list. So you just so want to skew of... the list, is what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe song, maybe, right? maybe put in another song, you know, because I knew this one would be on there for sure. But the the funny thing about it though is that I have to agree 110. I re- I really love the song. In fact, it's one of the songs I learned first on guitar from Kiss was this song, uh, and it's a cool song to to play on guitar. And a, an interesting point too. While it's a very uh, great version on Dress to Kill, and you know, again, Bogart having his little fingers in the pie there, trying to get them to make it as catchy as possible, I find that the version that's on Double Platinum is even a, an attempt to make it that much more poppy. If you notice in that version of it, the acoustic guitar is way more up on that version, and the electric guitars are kind of brought down and almost trying to force a more pop. Uh, uh, sort of appeal. We knew that, you know, Double Platinum was going to be a big seller for them as a greatest hits album. So, you know, why not even try to, you know, relight the fire of that song, maybe sell some extra copies of Dress to Kill, right? Yep. Yep. Great, great pick. Yeah. Uh, and again, I was guilty of, my sister had a guitar back in those days, and uh, one of the first songs I tried to figure out on guitar, and the, the rhythm riff is really fun. Sounds mm-hmm. great. Uh, except when I play it. All right, so in first place, on 35 points, the only unanimous pick that all four of us had in our list, and it is, of course, NB2299. So why don't you... (laughs) Oh, gosh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Funnily enough, though, after I guessed the uh, Matrix numbers for those other two singles, I looked at the next song, like, oh, that one's... I had to double check to make sure I was right. Tomorrow. The uh, should have been a hit single off the Unmasked yeah. album. Very appropriate as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of that album. So no surprise whatsoever that that has won our panel. Uh, Mark, let's start with you since uh, it was your top pick, I believe, unless I got your list backwards. No, it was it was number one. I mean, I think when I think of a uh, Kiss in pop songs. That to me is one of the ones that come instantly to, to mind because I mean, you know, Unmasked has always been labeled the pop kiss album. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what the hell happened? So to me, the strong. <laughs> Am I like frozen or something? Yeah, that's why we're laughing at you. <laughs> <laughs> so. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a well written song. Again, it it has all the markings of the, what makes a pop song great on here, and again, it helps that on this record, they were going for pop music from beginning to end. So again, mm-hmm. all the strongest parts were brought up, all the strongest ideas were probably brought forth. Benny Ponce is very good at this kind of stuff, as we learned from Dynasty. So. You know, it was it should have been a match made in heaven. Again, I think a lot of it had to do that, you know, radio kind of snubbed and poo-pooed kiss at that time. So they probably didn't want to play much much kiss on the radio. But if they did, I think this song would have did really good. Yeah, it's a it's a shame that it didn't. Um I also ranked this very highly. Uh, I missed opportunity for the band. I mean, it's almost like they should have released it under a different band name because mm-hmm. sometimes you're just polluted in the marketplace by what people think of you and your image and of course the the Vegas image that they had going um, and most people's minds would have been puking blood fire and all that um, 
that it's a shame that it wasn't released secretly under some other name so that Neil Bar Bogart could have then come out and said, ha, that was Kiss, and it's a number one or <laughs> top ten hit or something. So, um, Lonnie, let's go to you next. Yeah, I mean, we we talked about this when we talked about um, Unmasked in, in the past, how much we all, all four of us, I think all four of us were on that episode and how much of appreciation we have for the song and how much it was of a missed opportunity um for the band just kind of and i don't and i don't think much of anything they could have released in 1980 could have been a hit because like julian said they had such a everybody had their opinion of them at that point and to the everybody had their opinion of them to that point that they didn't even tour america for unmasked but you know what i mean so so I don't I don't think anything they would have released in 1980 really would have broke through any kind of barriers. So, but it's a, but it doesn't take away from the fact that tomorrow is a, is a great song and it's very catchy, very poppy, very to the point with what they were trying to achieve with Unmasked. If, you, if somebody asks you what were they doing in 1980 with Unmasked, because you know that's always an argument. People say, well, why why was Kiss releasing Unmasked when you know ACDC is releasing Back in Black because it was just a, a poll on the FAQ earlier in the week. But if you just look, if you have that person listen to tomorrow, th this is what, this is exactly what they were trying to achieve is what with this song that they, this is the image they were going for right or wrong. This is what they wanted. And what they achieved it with tomorrow, they achieved what they wanted with that song. And, you know, it should have, in my opinion, it's, it's much stronger than a lot of stuff that was popular in 1980. And it, it could have been a hit, but unfortunately for the band at that moment in time, like I said, I don't think anything could have been. Yeah, and, and come on, ACDC, you know, wasn't exactly storming up the singles charts with Correct. anything off Back in Black. Um, Aerosmith had what? Remember, Walking in the Sand as their single, you know, that's December 79. So Rush had also gone a bit softer hadn't they in 1980 in mm -hmm. terms of the commercial you know and judas priest is emerging with british steel which wasn't setting the singles charts on fire either so it it, it all is what it is um ken well uh, that's a great song i mean what can i say about it? i can see what they're going for um they were trying to get more hit singles. I mean, it did pretty well. It was kind of a popish sound for, you know, Dynasty. Um, the, the other thing is that there was music out at the time, like the, you know, Blondie and the Cars and that similar type. And this could fall into that kind of uh, sounding of music. So they were, they were obviously going for it. I know they said they, they for instance, on Dynasty, that Vinnie Pancia or whatever he was you know they threw peter a bone to keep you know to uh, to keep him in the band and so they recorded with him so i was surprised that they uh, kept him around for another album actually uh i guess they really did want to go that direction thinking oh well we did pretty good with i was made for loving you so let's you know continue it so anyway uh it's just a great song i remember that song, I, I played the second side of that, not first, but I, I played it more because of, of that song, liking that song. I purposely played uh, side two of the album uh, for that song is the main reason. Um, and it's a great lead off song for that side of the album. Uh, and it should have been, yeah, it should have been a hit in my opinion. Again, you know, they, you, like you said, they should have released it as a, uh kind of mystery band kind of thing or something like that and then see what we you know would happen did i get everyone's thoughts on that mark did i get yours I kind of lost yeah, myself that was there. first yeah. so so that's not surprising let's talk about some of our songs that didn't make our list or didn't make the group list and two of my songs were see you in your dreams obviously the rock and roll over version which to me is kind of poppy, but it, it was just one that popped into my head more than anything mm -hmm. else and shouted out loud, which mm -hmm. is being a Holly song or being inspired by a Holly song is kind yeah. of pure pop. And I'm, 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 that was on my list. I'm, I'm surprised it made my list because I always bag on that song. Mm -hmm. Um, but there, there you go. Um, Ken, couple on your list were, yeah. uh, Naked City. 
Shout It Out Loud, mm-hmm. A World really Without like Heroes, and Reason yeah. to Live. Tell us about some of those. Yeah, reason. I mean, uh, for instance, Reason to Live, uh, I thought should have been a huge hit, in my opinion. It's just the perfect, perfect song for radio at the time. Uh, so close to similar and similar to Heart. I mean, it's so similar to what was uh, hit songs for Heart at the time, um, just shortly before that. Um, and then, you know, See You Tonight, you know, I kind of had the loophole there. I mean, <laughs> we couldn't pick the solo album, so I figured out, uh, unplugged, I'll use this unplugged <laughs> and throw a See You Tonight on there, which I think is a great pop song by Gene. I mean, it's great. It's a little, it's very simple, but it's it's catchy and memorable. Um, you know, very, very good stuff. Uh, and then the other one, A World Without Heroes, I think is a, you know, kind of a, I think it's a, it's a real good song. It was released as a single. Uh, I thought this is just a nice, cool pop song that I've always you know liked. Yeah. So I'm. You also had Beth, and I'm sorry. Six of oh. your six of your picks did not make well, the chart. That's okay. But, you overthought yeah, it with all your. Beth, <laughs> Beth was a kind of a, just making a point that you know it's 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 a very important song in, in Kiss's history. And it was a pop hit. Um, when they were trying to play other music, they turned that one turned out to be the the hit. Uh, so I just think it's it's very important. Had they not had that song, I don't know what would have happened. They would have totally steered away from uh, destroy what well, they did anyway. But they would have, I think, uh, maybe even gone harder rock uh, and maybe kept at it. Uh, down the line. I don't know. Who knows what would have happened. All right. So, Mark, uh, I, if my counting's right, five of your songs didn't make the list. And What Makes the World Go Round, great pick, uh, My Way, Bang Bang You, mm-hmm. Shandy, and I Was Made for Loving You. You were the, no, actually, you and Lonnie both had I Was Made. So, uh, tell us about some of those. Well, I mean, What Makes the World Go Round, I think, is kind of clot cut from a similar cloth of like tomorrow it has a very similar sort of approach you know the big gigantic chorus you know what makes the world go it's so memorable that kind of uh chorus and they're very harmonized it has all those kind of interesting little guitar parts in it as well that keeps it interesting when it's not singing which which is another trick that producers try to do as well is that if you're going to put in a non-vocal part try to keep it not too complicated and make it memorable. So that whole did, 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 thing that happened afterwards, you know, that was a very catchy part that was slapped in there. And, you know, it, it it's, I just thought overall it was a pretty strong song. My way, I was sort of a, I guess a controversial choice, mainly because, you know, it's not exactly everybody's cup of tea, that song, but it has all those elements that I was talking about before that are present on Turn On The Night. It has that big keyboardy pad in there. Uh, it has a very memorable chorus, in my opinion. I mean, and some of Paul Stanley's highest singing. And of course, producers back in the day tried to push singers to sing higher because it projected stronger on and through speakers. And especially if you're going to be on, you know, AM or FM radio, you want to have that voice come blasting through. You know, so even if you're in a party or something, or at a club. You know, you want that to kind of stand out and make people go, hey, what the hell is that? And just kind of pay attention to it. That's These are all things I learned when I was going through production school back in the day. So it's interesting that I still retain that up in this noodle here. Uh, bang, bang, you. It's sort of the same thing. I mean, it, this is that's a little bit more raunchier, I guess, a guitar song. But it has some of the same elements. It has, you know, that keyboard part underneath the, of course, the bang, bang, you. And it's all those stabs that are underneath it that kind of give it that you know, poppy kind of feel to the to the chorus in it. So I always thought that that was one of the songs that kind of jumped out when I first heard Crazy Nights. I was like, wow, it's kind of a interesting song. Um, Shandy, I mean, come on. that That's one of the songs, again, that they pretty much were gunning for radio for. I mean, they made a video for it and everything. And it's, it's, it's just another typical example of a pop song. Very simple you know, based around a girl. That, that's always a, a, a writer, lyrical writer's trick too. If you want to try to write a pop song that's popular, write it around a girl and try to make it specific. 
that's why you, they pick names, right? You know, Sherry and all these other songs, they're all names that are, you know, yeah, well, there you go. Exactly. So right. I just, I just wanna is a pop song. Because it's about uh, a girl. Well, but it's not titled from the girl, right? But, you know. Uh, but, it, you know, it, you, can, you can make that argument too. I just want to. has pop elements in there as too, right? You know. But uh, I was made for loving you. I mean, again, we just talked about that not long ago, just saying that that was a song written with the radio in mind and trying to get, you know into the chart. I mean, I mean, Paul Stanley says, yeah, I, I heard it at, at a, you know, club 54 and thought, Hey, I can do that too. But you know, if it was a bad idea, I'm sure Vinny Ponce would have said no nah, and, and stomped it out. Right. So I'm, I'm sure he knew just as well as anybody else who's a good record producer that this was a good idea and would have probably gave him a lot of radio play. And it did a great deal to them. I mean, th that's what gave them that big, huge record contract that they got afterwards was pretty much on the strength of this song. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Lonnie, you also had five of your picks rejected by the panel. Uh, hide your heart forever. Talk to me. I was made for loving you, Shandy. Yeah, I mean, I think hide, hide your heart. I don't. I don't think there's. I mean, that's that's extremely popular with that with that with that catchy chorus and like the sing along type mm -hmm. chorus. Um, I, I'm surprised that I'm the only one that that had that song. I thought that's one of the first songs I thought of. And I thought of. Of poppy kiss songs because it, it's such a catchy sing-along type chorus um with, with a great pop feel to it so much so that you know a lot of other artists you know re, you know took that song and, and recorded it themselves um forever i mean come on how is that not on your guys's list it was co uh, look at ken off. see ken oh, off. Of, Ken, every song was dropped off I mean, your it list. Was, every it was song close. was dropped off your list. No it longer surprise. It's not pop, it's yeah. a ballad. So, that close. Again, like I said, I'm contradicting myself um, from earlier. But Hide Your Heart is co-written co by Michael Bolton. Come on, what's more poppy than that? So, so I had so I had to put Forever on there because it is it is a ballad co-written by Michael Bolton. It doesn't have a girl's name in the title, sorry. But it still counts, and it still should be on there. Yeah, it could be changed to For Heather. For Heather. There you go. Hey. For why, Heather. Why didn't, it, could have had a, it could have been top five. Yeah, remake this. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, just have it sung by it. Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's uh, not no more. I'd like to hear that. For Heather. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I have two others on here from the album at hand from Unmasked with with Talk to Me and Shandy. You know, Talk Talk to Me is a very poppy song to me. I, it's an it's an ace. I think I'm the only one that had an Ace Frehley That's pop true. song on their list. So Ken, you can hate me for not having for not liking Gene or Peter. Well, you got all you guys hate Ace. None of you had Ace on your list. So, but but Talk to Me is very poppy. I mean, I mean, Kiss goes from <laughs> From from Mr. Speed and take me to to talk to me. Well, how much of a of a change in direction is that? And and the song is very is very um, poppy and fits right in with what they were looking for with with the pop album of Unmasked and and Shandy does as well. To what Mark said that they they liked it so much they made a video out of it and thought that they thought that they had something with with that song and unfortunately you know or fortunately they didn't so. Um, those are I only half of mine made the list, but I think you, some of you guys are crazy for not having them on yours. Yeah, and, you know, th there we go. I, I just told you, I just want to, and you did not have a pick off revenge. So there you go. I are. did not. You Ken thought I could have. You're Ken obviously fine. All ten of mine would be off of revenge. You're finally going off that album. What a, what a shame. <laughs> all right. So those are our picks. What are our egregious omissions from this? Um, which songs do you think are pop? How are our definitions of pop wrong or right? Um, who had the best picks? Ken. Um, you know, th there we go. In our next episode, we're going to do, we're going to strap on our eight string guitars and do our top 10 kiss grindcore songs. 
No, we're not. They'll do. I think I just saw some good topics on the board I want to discuss Raps in the songs. next episode. So that's it. That's our pop episode. The songs that we think best represent Kiss Pop. Um, now go put some pop rocks in your cat's kitty litter and have a real fun show. So thanks for joining us. So from Mark, from Ken, Lonnie, and myself, thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank you for spending time listening to the Kiss FAQ podcast today. All sales are final. There are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.